Okay. Uh, Uh, before you get uh, started, I uh, want you guys uh, I let you guys know that you know I want you guys know that uh, this talk uh, will be uh, recorded until the end, and then Q and A uh, not uh, will not be uh, recorded. So uh, let's begin. Uh, good afternoon, guys. Uh, thank you all for uh, joining us today uh, for the special uh, Zoom lecture. Uh, we are going to have about fifty minute uh, lecture and followed by Q and A uh, session. It is a great pleasure and honor to have Professor Maya Stiller at the University of Kansas. Uh, she is a scholar in Korean art and visual culture focusing on Joseon uh, dynasty uh, period. She has uh, two PhDs, uh, one from the Free University of Berlin in 2008 in Korean art history, the other from UCLA in 2014 in Korean Buddhist studies. She also did a post her postdoc at Harvard. As an art historian uh, with an interdisciplinary approach, uh, Professor Stiller explores uh, visual patients of Buddhist faith and ritual practice in Joseon, uh, Korea. She's the author of many articles and the book, Carving Status at Kungangsan, the winner of the American Historical Association's 2021 Patricia Buckley Brie Prize. In uh, today's lecture, Professor Stiller will talk about uh, this book, which marks a paradigm shift in the research about East Asian uh, mountains by introducing an entirely new field, orthographic rock uh, gravity. So please welcome uh, Professor Stiller. Thank you so much for um, good afternoon, everyone. And um, thank you, Professor Kim, for the kind introduction. It, it is truly an honor to be invited to speak to your class and to everyone joining the Zoom today. Um, I'm thrilled to engage in a stimulating discussion with all of you um, who have joined us here on Zoom. I would also like to express my sincere gratitude to each and every one of you for taking the time to attend this talk. Additionally, I would like to extend my deepest appreciation to the Weatherhead East Asia Institute for graciously hosting this talk. Thank you again for having me, and I look forward to an enlightening conversation. Today, I will delve into the history of one of um, East Asia's most prominent mountains, Gumgangsan, also known in the West as the Diamond Mountains. As many of you may already know, Gumgangsan holds significant cultural and historical importance, particularly within the realm of Korean history. Through this presentation, I hope to provide a deeper understanding of this remarkable site, its cultural significance, and the historical context surrounding it. As indicated on the map in the slide, Gumgangsan is located in the northern part of Gangwon province and is currently situated in North Korea. My book, Carving Status at Kumgangsan, explores the journeys to this mountain during the late Joseon period. My analysis of approximately 180 travel prose texts has revealed fascinating insights into the travel patterns of late Joseon travelers to Kumgangsan. It shows that these travelers would typically journey from Hansong, present day Seoul, along the Northeast Highway. The journey would take them through the iconic Hewa Gate as depicted on the right of the slide, and onwards to Nuwon, Yangju, uh, Choron, and Kimwa. And upon reaching Kimwa, they would exit the highway and take a side road to Kumgangsan via Dambalyong, Haircut Ridge, the gateway into Kumgangsan. It would take at least five days to arrive at Dambalyong, and once they reached Kumgangsan, they would typically spend around five to seven days exploring the stunning natural beauty of the region before venturing to the coast for 10 to 20 days. And finally, they would either return to the capital or travel to their hometown or report to their new um, government post. This map provides a meticulous overview of late Joseon Kumgangsan, illuminating prominent landmarks such as monasteries, waterfalls, and pools. Since Kumgangsan forms an integral part of the Tebek Sanmek, the Tebek mountain range, the principal drainage divide of this range runs north-south through the heart of Kumgangsan. The eastern section of Kumgangsan 
both precipitous slopes and is referred to as Auda Kumgang or Wegumgang. Conversely, the western half of Kumgangsan features more gently undulating wooded slopes and it's referred to as Inner Kumgang or Ne Kumgang. And um, this, there is one, like the southwestern region within the western part, marked here by a red circle, um, that this area is widely regarded as the cultural and religious epicenter of Kumgangsan due to its abundance of Buddhist monasteries and hermitages. By tracing the travel route of Iha Jin and Kim Chang -jip, this map also offers insights into the development of the typical itinerary of a late Joseon elite traveler in, uh, through the mountain. The blue dotted line indicates the travel route of an early Joseon traveler. During the 16th and 17th centuries, travelers primarily focused on visiting places in Inner Kumgang, such as uh, Changansa and Myogilisang, before moving on to the coastline. However, in the 18th and 19th centuries, the travel route, represented here by a green dotted line, expanded to encompass sites in outer Kumgang, including Ongyodong and Kuryong Pokpo, so Tate Stream Ravine or Nine Dragon Falls. In order to provide you with a better sense of the mountain's physical appearance, allow me to share with you some rare and stunning photographs that I personally captured during my visits. This particular photograph offers a breathtaking view of the upper portion of Mampokdong, 10,000 Falls Ravine, nestled in the heart of Ina Gumgang. During my visit in May 2014, I was struck by the delicate and vibrant shades of lime green that adorned the lush vegetation. One of the most notable features of Ina Gumgang is the expanse of verdant forests that adorn its slopes, interspersed with occasional pillars, walls, or rock battlements that add to its stunning natural beauty. Here you can see a striking photograph of Mamul Cho, an exquisite example of the eroded granite cliffs that have earned Kumgangsan its well-deserved reputation. In particular, the outer Kumgang region, including the impressive cliffs of Mamul Cho, bears witness to the powerful forces of weathering and denudation that have given rise to a magnificent array of rock formations that endow Gumgangsan with this unique character. This captivating photograph um, presents a ground level view of Jade Stream Ravine or Ong Niu Dong in outer Gumgang. To give a sense of scale, one of my mountain guides kindly agreed to pose in the picture, emphasizing the remarkable height of the slopes compared to a person's stature. In addition, this image also highlights the noteworthy aspect of the Kumgangsan landscape that has until now eluded scholarly attention. The presence of integrate inscriptions carved onto the naturally polished rock floors, walls and boulders that dot the mountain. These photos capture a breathtaking view from the top of a cliff behind Jade Stream Ravine, where I was fortunate enough to, enough to visit. 200 yards below me were the magnificent upper eight pools, Sangpaldam, with their deep emerald blue waters connected by small waterfalls. The stream flowing through these pools ultimately cascades down to the 30 yard tall Nine Dragon Falls. It was truly a remarkable experience to witness this natural scenery firsthand. In the background of this photo, you can see the stunning Nine Dragon Falls, known throughout Korea for its natural beauty. During my visit, I had the privilege of sharing a scenic lunch with two North Korean minders and two mountain guides while overlooking this breathtaking sight. As this talk will be recorded and made available online, I have chosen to protect their privacy by obscuring their faces. For my research on this mountain, I utilized a cross-disciplinary approach for innovative perspectives, including a prosopographical analysis of autographic rock inscriptions, an approach that I took from social historians like Peter Ball, an examination of historical and literary records, such as royal court records, travel diaries, and songs for historical and literary, literary studies insights. 
An analysis of visual and material records, such as rock inscriptions, paintings, maps, and board games, for which I used art history and cultural anthropology methods. And I used geospatial analysis. All the maps that you have seen in this presentation so far were created from scratch. And during the process of making them, I was able to visualize spatial relations of my data, including concentration and scarcity, distance and proximity, access and isolation, which generated valuable new knowledge and insights. Moving forward, I'd like to highlight the key contributions of my book, which you can see the cover of on the left. Reviewers have compared it to Robert Harris's Landscape of Words as both deal with stone inscriptions. However, my work focuses specifically on autographic rock inscriptions. While other art historians have written about Kumgang San, such as C.P. Park in his New Middle Kingdom book, or So Young Lee in her Metropolitan Museum show and Catalog Diamond Mountains, um, um, which took place a few years ago. If you were already in New York City, you may have seen it. Um, so these art historical publications focus on paintings depicting the mountains. But my book takes a cross-disciplinary approach, examining a range of materials to draw conclusions about Gumgang San's significance for Le Chosan people. Carving status makes a significant contribution to the current material turn in art history by examining and conceptualizing rock or stone-based material. This represents a shift away from the traditional art historical focus on painting, which has dominated the field of Korean art history for decades. While numerous dissertations have been written about Kumgang San painting, my book is the first to explore the significance of Kumgang San's rock material. My book delves into the concept of site specificity, demonstrating how the use of site specific material can serve as a marker of social competition and recognition. By inscribing their names on the rock surfaces of Kumgangsan, travelers were able to create a lasting memory of their visit that extended beyond institutional boundaries. In the late Joseon, this act of Self-commemoration through graffiti writing became a mandatory ritual for Kumgangsan travelers. In the late Joseon, autographic inscriptions were a common sight in the landscape. Joseon scholars referred to them as Taemyeong, which means signing one's name with other people after visiting or seeing a site. The term is frequently found in travel records, songs, gazetteers, and encyclopedias of the time. In my work, I also use the term graffiti, which may have negative connotations in modern English. However, in the context of pre-modern cultural practices and archeological research, graffiti does not necessarily imply something negative or illegal. Instead, it refers to the act of adding social and cultural value to a location through inscriptions. So I use the terms autographs, signatures, and graffiti interchangeably um, in my work to describe the inscriptions that added cultural and social significance to the mountain. This 19th century album leaf by an anonymous painter offers a visual representation of the practice of autographic inscriptions at Kumgangsan. The painting depicts a group of travelers in 10,000 Falls Ravine with one of them you can see on the left, on the right, I mean, one of them engaged in the act of writing his name on the rock surface. The figure is shown climbing up a boulder with a dripping wet brush in his right hand, poised to write the second character of his name after completing the first. This scene is a vivid illustration of the widespread practice of autographic inscriptions at Kumgang San during the 18th and 19th centuries. In contrast to literate travelers who wrote their names in Sinitic script on the rocks, local masons, including those employed by Buddhist monasteries or working as corvée laborers, were the ones responsible for carving them. Using iron tools and a grindstone, they needed to heat their tools to break the granite. As we all know, granite is one of the hardest stones on earth. 
This still from a 1915 film made by a German missionary provides rare footage of this practice. As depicted in the lower right of this image, you could see the name carved right here, newly carved names had a fresh look, a fresh light appearance before being overgrown by lichens. Up until now, Kumgangsan has primarily been studied in the context of literati landscape, literati style landscape painting within the field of art history. For instance, Song Son's complete view of inner Kumgang displayed in the slide has become the iconic painting of Kumgangsan. And researchers following this traditional framework focus on trivial landscape painting, a specific type of painting that merged multiple earlier traditions into one during the early 18th century and purportedly served as a virtual travel guide. Chong Son, an iconic figure in this discussion, supposedly popularized Kumgangsan travel and had a significant influence on later landscape painting traditions. However, recent scholarship by Sung Lim Kim, J.P. Park, and others has highlighted the growing demand for and appreciation of Chong Son's artworks among a wider range of individuals in later Joseon society. Their research showed that depictions of real places were employed to announce and establish one's social status within the community. The latest narrative suggests that late Joseon scholars utilized renowned sites like Kumgangsan for identity construction and self-promotion. My research builds upon this prior work, but it calls for a paradigm shift in current Korean art historical research regarding the esteemed genre of landscape painting. In order to gain a more nuanced understanding of the significance of Kumgangsan travel, a broader examination of Joseon visual and material culture is necessary. For my carving status book project, I gathered an extensive amount of data from my trip consisting of roughly 7,000 photographs. From this talk collection, and this is what um, I did mostly during my three year postdoc at Harvard, I carefully handpicked 1,300 images to conduct a thorough visual analysis of the photographs. And then over the course of several years, I transcribed all the inscriptions found in the photographs into multiple Excel files. In total, I was able to gather information on approximately 4,557 individuals who made their journey to the mountain between the mid 16th to the early, um, between the mid 16th and early 20th centuries. To make this metadata machine readable, I divided it into 18 tables, each containing hundreds of rows. The largest of these tables, a detailed view of which is displayed in the slide, contains 4,600 rows, each corresponding to an individual traveler and 30 columns that provide more specific information about each person, such as their name, life date, social status, government positions, relationships with fellow travelers, and so on. According to, the, to this um, metadata analysis, I found that Kumgas and inscriptions can be classified into various categories. Unlike pilgrimage sites like Taishan in China, there is a conspicuous absence of inscriptions containing religious content such as the Buddhist sutras that are engraved on Taishan. Out of the 4,500 inscribed names, roughly 2,400 were organized into about 848 clusters. These clusters were the central focus of my prosopographical analysis because studying groups of individuals allowed for cross-checking and verifying biographical data more effectively. While my book presents general conclusions drawn from this metadata, it does not include all of the intricate details. So to ensure that my entire body of work is accessible to scholars interested in analyzing rock inscriptions in present-day North Korea, I developed a digital platform, the Autographic Atlas of Korea, AAOK, which can be accessed at www.aok.info. Um, since we are cur currently um, running a few tests, the site is actually operating in beta mode on a separate server, which I will be happy to share later when we are in the, um, in the, in the Q&A. I will put a, a link to that in, in, a, in the Zoom chat in case you would like to explore it further. 
To develop the trilingual search engine, I carefully curated feature-level metadata and relational data pertaining to these rock inscriptions. I also meticulously designed and implemented a data, the data architecture, which is like a three-dimensional architecture for the uh, MySQL server from which the um, website retrieves the relational data. My hope is that the search engine will facilitate future qualitative and quantitative data analyses of these inscriptions. So when, select, when you go on the website and when selecting the filtered search engine tile on the AOK website's landing page, you will be redirected to the database search web page shown in this slide. And utilizing the advanced search function, users can refine their search by selecting specific features such as location, travel period, or inscription type to fine tune their results. What captivated my interest in the Kumgasan inscriptions and, and kept me invested in this project were the intriguing glimpses in, they provided into the social connections and relationships of these travelers. It is this fascination that underpins the design of the AOK search engine. And um, I hope that this will really serve as an invaluable research resource for researchers seeking to gain a deeper understanding of the social history of travel in Korea. Displayed in English, Korean, and Hunter, the search results highlight the social status of the inscriber, including their social status, any government positions that they may have held, as well as the other individuals in, um, in the same cluster that of the people that they traveled with and their relationships to one another. And the research and the search results include photographs of each inscription's location on the mountain. So yeah, I really hope this was a lot of work, as you can imagine. So I hope that this search en engine will uh, keep on running um, and will prove to be a valuable resource for the study of Joseon period travel. In the following slides, I will discuss two clusters before moving to the final part of my talk in which I will focus on paintings and board games. What I found particularly fascinating was the prevalence of agnatic clusters or agnative associative clusters, revealing a late chosen elite practice of creating such clusters as a strategy of establishing cultural distinction. So agnatic clusters basically means only members of the same family traveling to the mountain together. They're all blood, blood related. And the agnetic associative are usually clusters where there was a family, uh, main members of a family traveling with some friends of the family. So that's why a kind of a mix of agnetic and associative. And associative is just a cluster of people's names who were um, not blood related. Some of them were related through the maternal um, line, not the paternal line. Um, and the research I did on those clusters is of great value because it sheds light on the late chosen elite's adherence to orthodox Confucian principles of kin relationships and connections in order to assert their social, political, and cultural dominance over lower elites and near elites who would have been unable to have their inscriptions carved. The existence of agnatic rock inscriptions which were restricted to central elites and those in government positions, serves as evidence of the fact that late Joseon society was a lineage-based society with extended elite families organized around the principle of patrilineal descent. This slide shows a multi-generational family cluster carved on a cliff at 10,000 Falls Ravine. Between 1690 and 1790, government official Yun Sa-guk and several male members of his family carved their names here. Yun Sa-guk visited Kumgangsan multiple times during his tenure as governor of Kangwon province, and he is known for supporting Buddhist monasteries and for his calligraphy skills. But the fact that male members of his family created a graffiti cluster at Kumgangsan is a significant discovery that revealed a previously unknown sociocultural aspect of their travels. 
The cluster consists of three layers, with the oldest layer, highlighted here in yellow, um, contained, contains the names of Yun Zaguk's great uncle, Yun Ji Hua, and Yi He Cho, who traveled together to Kumgangsan in 1690, as indicated by the date below. The second cluster, highlighted in red, consists of An Jing, Yun Gyeong Yong, and Gyeong Yong San, Yun Zaguk. They visited Kumgangsan in 1736, when Yun Gyeong Yong served as superintendent of Gosan Postal Station, located approximately 60 miles northwest of Kumgangsan. Yun Saguk's name is part of the second layer, but it is also part of the third and final layer, highlighted in blue, that was added in 1790, when Yun Saguk took his son Yun Jae Hee and his nephew Yun Jae Suk on a trip to Kumgangsan shortly after being appointed governor of Gangwon. The ability to create such an agnatic cluster over several generations was a privilege of renowned aristocratic families, revealing their social and cultural capital. This three-layered cluster is a prime example of such travel behavior. This slide depicts an associative cluster of individuals' names, all of whom were employed by the royal court. The eunuch Huan Myung, the personal attendant of King Kojong and Crown Prince Yi Chok, was the leader of the group. His elevated social status is evinced by the larger size and prominent placement of his name to the very right of the inscription, positioned slightly above the names of his fellow travelers. To the left, Jung In, Kim Young Gyu, Hong Tae Jong, and Ju Unam wrote their names in three vertical rows of equal height and size, indicating similar social status. These three Chungin worked as clerks at the royal court. This cluster represents the friendship of four royal court colleagues and provides insight into their social connections, which may have otherwise been unknown because um, Chungin, eunuchs, they didn't leave any writings, right? They didn't leave any records. Um, so this is one of the only records we have um, of that, of the, that talks about the existence of these people. Let's now shift our focus from the tangible presence of the mountain to the intangible realm of imagination. So what we've done so far is we've looked at elite travelers. These two early 20th century photographs showcase affluent individuals embarking on their journey. While our prior discussion has centered around concrete proof of elite travelers venturing to the mountain and carving their names, it is important to acknowledge that travel to Kumgangsan was a challenging and expensive undertaking reserved for a privileged few. Kumgangsan has such a profound cultural influence in Joseon society that familiarity with its celebrated landmarks and legends constituted an indispensable component of cultural literacy. Just as modern day globe trotters showcase their grasp of the latest culinary and sartorial trends in bustling metropolis, in metropolises like New York City, Los Angeles, and Berlin, the lettered members of Joseon society were compelled to exhibit their knowledge of Kumgangsan to project an air of sophistication. The presence of narrative screens, as portrayed on the left on the slide, serves as a testament to this trend. These screens depicting sites in Kumgangsan were not necessarily intended to guide prospective travelers to, uh, for, um, for on an actual like sojourn to the mountain, but rather to instruct elites and aspiring elites on the historical and cultural significance of Kumgangsan's most famous landmarks. A 19th century painting in the Liam's collection which was actually on view in the Diamond Marvels exhibition in the, at the Metropolitan a few years ago, where I first discovered it. <laughs> um, so this painting exemplifies the episodic narration of Kumgangsan's most famous waypoints. The artist's envisioned tour of Kumgangsan starts at the lower right of the painting, where the virtual visitor departs from the village of Kumsong, which is located 10 li away from Chang'an Monastery according to the inscription. The beholder then moves through the painting in a zigzag pattern 
passing two of Gumgangsan's most renowned sites on their right, the ports of Nine Dragon Falls and 10,000 Falls Ravine. And then travelers are presented in the painting Cross a Bridge on the lower left, passing by uh, Pyeongsa, Changansa, Baekcheongdong on their left before arriving at Shinge Monastery, depicted on the right edge of this painting. Then, after moving through a narrow pathway flanked by Wolchulbong and Ilchulbong, the beholder's eyes are drawn to iconic waypoints at other parts of the mountain, such as uh, Bodogam's Holzong Tower and uh, Chongyang's Chongyang Monastery. And further, like meandering paths in the upper portion of the painting enable the viewer to move between various culturally significant waypoints. With little regard for topographical precision, the anonymous artist fashioned a fascinating collage of Gumgangsan's most iconic locations, incorporating locations from both inner and outer Gumgang and organizing them based on their perceived cultural significance. The artist strategically positioned key sites at the beginning of the journey with the entire composition encircled by a series of jagged peaks that symbolize the rugged terrain of Kumgangsan. This masterful portrayal serves as a veritable greatest hits of Kumgangsan, showcasing its most famous landmarks in a stunning visual display. An additional means of acquainting oneself with key cultural landmarks was by engaging in board games like the one depicted in this slide. The maker of this board game used a large sheet of paper measuring 56 inches in length and 41 inches in width, sectioned off into a grid featuring the eight provinces of Choson, each containing a famous location's name inscribed in literary Saninic. Situated at the center is the game's title, Chonggu Namsungdo, or Map of Visiting Renowned Spots in Joseon. On the left side of this map, one can see the game pieces, representing different personas such as the pure sleeve poet, the yellow crowned Taoist, the black cloaked monk, the fisherman wearing a straw raincoat, and the red sleeve beauty. The game commences from Hanyang, continuing counterclockwise through the provinces, including Gyeonggi, Chungcheong, Jeolla, uh, Gyeongsang, Gangwon, Hamyongdo, Pyongyangdo, Hwangedo, and Gyeonggi again, and, and then back to um, Hansong. And the pathways that players actually followed within each province were modeled after authentic postal roads. In the middle left section of the painting, prominent sites including Kumgangsan and other celebrated locales of the Guangdong region are showcased. The player's subsequent move was determined by the number on the dice, leading them either forward or backward on the designated path. So for instance, if the player was at Kumgangsan and rolled a two, they would be required to retrace their steps to Sogangsan in the north. Conversely, rolling a five would allow them to leap forward to Manzegyo, a mere 20 miles northeast of Seoul. Each copy of the game came with a booklet providing a comprehensive list of all 120 sites and a brief summary of their historical and cultural significance. So by participating in this game, players could simulate the behaviors of elite travelers while also gaining knowledge of cultural trivia about notable Korean sites, thus improving their cultural literacy. In the 1850s, Yu Bonjong, a non-office holding member of a Sajok family, hosted a gathering of his friends at Kyomga Pavilion or Kyomga Jong, his residence in Seoul. Along with his unemployed friend, Yu Sop, Yu had designed a board game called Diagram of Eight Celestial Beings Going on Recumbent Travel for the occasion. Palson Wayuto. The game was played with eight participants, each taking on the role of a different celestial being that owned 10 palaces scattered across the peninsula. Starting at Gyeonggap Pavilion, depicted in the center, 
the players followed a circular path dictated by the roll of the dice to visit 81 famous cultural sites in all eight provinces. Once a player arrived at one of their palaces, they were required to complete a special task. The circle representing Kumgangsan, located in the upper right quadrant of the game, was assigned to the celestial being referred to as Poem. So if the Poem player arrived at Kumgangsan, they had to write a record, uh, a key, or so on. Um, and that person um, wrote a travel record of Kumgangsan, actually. Following the party, you compiled a 58-page handwritten book of the literary works created during the game, along with the original board game. Prior to, centering, prior to entering the collection of the Kyuzhangak archives at Seoul National University, the book was cherished by Yu's descendants and has survived to the present day as a testament to their ancestor Yu Bonzong. Yu's board game is a perfect example for the ways in which lower elites express their cultural identity through literary activities. This was particularly appealing to elite subgroups who were unable to visit famous sites, famous mountains directly. The game served as an educational tool, allowing literate individuals to learn the names and locations of famous cultural sites across the peninsula from the comfort of their own homes. The left side of this slide showcases an album leaf that dates back to 1880, crafted by the workshop of Kisan Kim Jong-un that catered to foreign travelers who visited Korea in the late 19th century. The leaf portrays three male individuals engaged in a rectangular board game that is similar in size to the one we previously examined. Through my research on board games, including the two travel board games we just looked at, I learned that board games were prevalent among literate families seeking to impart knowledge about societal roles and expectations to both themselves and their offspring. In playing this particular travel board game, which incorporated elements of drinking, poetry, and prose writing as punishment, although such achievements were actually considered to be accolades as players progressed around the board, cultured individuals found an alternative means to convey their cultural capital and emulate the behavior of elite travelers, particularly if they were unable to physically journey to Kumgangsan. Now, allow me to conclude my presentation with a few thoughts. It is worth noting that Kumgangsan has the most extensive collection of autographic rock inscriptions in East Asia and quite possibly in the, in the entire world. These carvings serve as crucial markers of spatial reference, forming an integral component of the construction of sociocultural memory. By leaving the autographs, travelers adhered to a cultural custom that denoted them as individuals of erudition. Through these performative acts, they contributed to a collective memory that transcended their own lifetimes and social milieu, thus forging a link between the present and the past. During the late Joseon, agnatic clusters emerged as a notable development of these inscriptions. These clusters demonstrate the significance of Gumgangsan pilgrimages in establishing and renewing human connections across time. They also reveal the close association between social identity and esteemed ancestors during this period. The broad range of materials explored in this presentation offers a contextualizing perspective that expands upon the traditionally monolithic research of Kumgangsan related literary genre and art historical discussions of Kumgangsan landscape painting. This cross disciplinary approach not only establishes a previously unrecognized correlation between visual and literary traditions but also presents a comprehensive understanding of how Kumgangsan became an indelible fixture in Joseon society and culture. Kumgangsan's cultural significance was so profound that even impoverished Yangban, um, Yangban without any government office and near elites who could not visit the mountains in person resorted to imaginary travel aids 
such as paintings, songs, board games, in which Gumgangsan served as a commodified cultural trope utilized to establish social recognition through cultural knowledge of the mountains. In essence, Gumgangsan epitomizes the Koreans' actual and imagined engagement with a natural site in Korea. So thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to a lively and engaging Q&A session. If you must leave at this time, please do not hesitate to reach out to me at this email address. I would be delighted, delighted to respond to any inquiries or fabrications regarding the contents of my talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Stiller, uh, for really a uh, great and interesting uh, lecture today. So now we are going to have a Q&A session.